Before we get started with today's podcast, we'd like to ask returning listeners to leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you really enjoy it, share a link to this podcast with friends or family who would enjoy hearing our weekly discussions about basketball and basketball culture. Now, on to the show. Yeah, this is amazing. When Michigan can keep this game to a 19-foot, 9-inch game inside that three-point line, it's all there. Welcome to the 199 podcast. I would have played as Bill Clinton. We'll find out later which secret character he would have played with. Rayan El Ali is here. He's the author of a book about NBA Jam published by Boss Fight Books. Basketball, along with family and friends, has been helping me through the pandemic. And this book was just hours of pure joy. There was no Stranger Things this summer, so this was my escape to childhood. Welcome to the 99 podcast, Rayan Ali. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man. I, I, I really, lo- really love the book. Really appreciate you taking the time tonight to, to be here. And uh, just want to get into it. Uh, first, wh- where did the idea for a book about NBA Jam come from? So I've been a writer for many years. I started writing, I think it was even before I graduated college. So this is sometime in 2008. And I've been doing all this work uh, for music magazines. So what I do is I do short music articles. Like, let's say if you open up a free weekly paper, you see music preview in there. That'd be the kind of thing that I would write. Um, so I was working on music stuff for years. I wrote for Rolling Stone and Spin, nice. Wired, Complex, The Atlantic, all kinds of cool places. Um, but I knew at some point I really wanted to do a book, do something more substantial. So I pitched a couple of music books, and unfortunately, neither of them were accepted. Which one? Wait, which what'd you pitch? At, what'd you pitch on? I got to hear which bands you pitch on because you, you said music, and I'm like, oh, I want to know about these. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I was always, I've always loved punk rock. So okay. the first record I pitched on was this album called energy by this band called operation Ivy. Nice. And, um, so, yeah. So if you know, the band Rancid, they were the earlier version of Rancid. Yeah. Sort of. And, um, yeah, and they were really big for green day. In fact, I think operation Ivy's first record ended up paying for, uh, this label lookout records to make green day's first record. Wow. Um, so they had a really cool story and they were really influential in their scene. Um, the other one was this band called against me. Okay. And they've got an album called Reinventing Axl Rose. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another punk band. Um, But unfortunately, neither of those worked out. That's a bummer. um, Did you read the the No FX uh, autobiography or biography at all? Wait, there's one out? Yeah, yeah. You should, you would, I know this is a good good sidebar on a a basketball podcast, but No FX, it's it's an unbelievable, uh, ridiculous book, but it's it's good. One of my buddies who's a professor in Cincinnati, another Hooper, uh, sent it to me and it's pretty wild. (laughs) If you, if you like punk bands. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, you should check it out. Definitely, definitely. I'm a big NoFX fan too. I okay. haven't listened to NoFX much in a long time, but man, I remember seeing them in Dallas, Texas once when they did the Decline Live, <laughs> nice. which was their 18 minute song. Yeah. And that was incredible. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I pitched these music books and nothing worked out, but it happens. So yeah, so I was really trying to find uh, what I could pitch this publisher. The whole idea with Boss Fight Books is they do different books about different video games by different authors. So we'll do one book about Galga by one author, another book about Super and Brothers 2 by a separate author, and then Super and Brothers 3 by a totally different author entirely. So they had this open call in 2015, and I was like, I really want to write a book. Like, maybe this is the chance. The music books didn't work out. Maybe this is it. So I racked my brain. I was like, what is really worth writing about? Like, what is something that I love enough and that has enough of an interesting story behind it that I could really sink my teeth into it? And then after thinking about it for a little bit, I was like, oh, obviously NBA Jam. (laughs) And it just seemed so obvious to me the more I thought about it. I mean, NBA Jam was just once upon a time the biggest game in the world. I mean, the number I always love to throw out there is that Jurassic Park made something like $373 million in theaters in 1993. And that was the biggest move in 93 by far. Right. I mean, Jurassic Park was everywhere. I mean, the Raptors well, I think basically it, I named think it might have been. I think it might have been the biggest uh, movie this summer, too, since they didn't release any movies. They put that out yeah. in like, limited theaters. And I think that and like E.T. were number one. So it's back. <laughs> 
<laughs> absolutely. No, I can totally believe it. I mean, you watch Jurassic Park. It's absolutely, you know, you totally get why it's so big. Yeah. Um, but then what blew my mind was that Jurassic Park in 1993 made that huge figure in theaters, like 373 million. Yeah. And then NBA Jam made three times that much money through quarters slash tokens, made a billion dollars. And that stat alone was just so mind blowing to me that I was thinking, well, how can a game be so popular? And it'd be, you know, this game is just everywhere. They're doing all these franchises, these sequels, spinoffs, and then done. You know, you don't hear about yeah. it for years. And there hasn't been an NBA Jam game since 2010 uh, or 2011. So I was like, why did this happen? Um, and I know there's some good stories over there. There has to be. Yeah. And plus some cool interview subjects. Um, so that's how it started. And I went way above and beyond in my pitch. <laughs> I think most people do like eight to 10 pages for pitching the book to Boss Five Books. I did 37 pages. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I went all in. I, I basically wrote the book before I wrote the book. I wow. knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, and then thankfully, Boss Five Books said yes pretty fast and then everything went from there and that was back in 2015 and i was like oh this will take me like a year two years <laughs> you know this is great um and it ended up taking me four years oh um gosh. and then finally last october it came out you're like george um, R. george R. R. martin pace here on the winds of winter <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah my wife actually gave me a funko pop of george R. R. martin oh for gosh. christmas and Perfect. she gave it to the, the funko pop to me saying don't be like him like finish yes. the book this is before the book was finished uh, so thankfully at least i beat george R. R. martin that's I'm right you did you beat him i did i did yeah yeah <laughs> so it's been a, such a ride working on this book i mean you know i thought about it in 2015 with this idea and then all these years later i've got the physical book i did all the different interviews that went with it talked to all kinds of cool people it's really been such a ride now a word from our sponsors Days at Pizza is a build-your-own pizza place in Indiana and Kentucky. The Jalapeno Face is back. This pizza of the month is a jalapeno popper-inspired pizza and is one of Aza Pizza's most popular creations. It has ranch, cream cheese, delicious smoky bacon, and fresh sliced jalapenos. For a little heat, sweet pepper jelly, and toasted panko for some crunch. It's only here for August, so get it before it's gone. They also have a ton of ingredients you can choose from if jalapenos are too hot for you, to create something delicious on your own. Order online for curbside delivery at azippizza.com backslash order. Now, back to the show. You can pick up some bossfightbooks.com. They've got digital version, paperback now. So that, and it's on Amazon too. I, I like going to the regular website if I can, because I know that helps out authors. So, but uh, it's on Amazon too. I, that's where I first saw it. So you can definitely get it. And it is like the, the funny thing you said about the pitch, about the 37 pages is that I could almost imagine that you might, I don't know where that fit in the book, but like the start of it jumps right into this like time in Chicago where these guys are, I don't, I don't know what uh like what tv show it reminded me of but there's this like cast of characters and they're in this like you described the like the scenery in chicago s so well um did you do some like research on like how did you know like what it looked like or did you go there because that that part was like so visceral that that was the part where i was really thinking about like felt like I was there. Yeah, I appreciate that. That was actually a lot of work to try to put that whole scene together. Um, so yeah, so the scene is set at Dennis's Place for Games, which has been, which was been gone for years. Yeah, oh yeah, you couldn't have even visited it. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and that arcade was like, that was one of these spots in Chicago, but this is pre-internet. So I had to do a lot of like weird sleuthing to get that information <laughs> that I have for that section. So what I would do is, yeah, I definitely did lots of research uh, in terms of what the Midway guys had to say about about visiting that arcade. But then I use all kinds of weird sources. Like I would go in and, you know, find a Yelp review that also had a photograph of the arcade <laughs> in it or an article that oh, mentions wow. what the carpet looks like or, you know, a different <laughs> magazine article that has something about, you know, this is what the, the mirrors on the wall. So a lot of it was like putting stuff together and then just making sure all the facts lined up right so that it made sense. Um, that was one of the hardest parts to write by far because I'm like, bad. I mean, this place is long gone. I couldn't even visit it if I wanted to. Um, oh, oh my God, the, the, the best thing. part about yeah. it is that you, you did all like describing it sounds like how hard that must have been, like like uh, the the catching the Golden State Killer. But then it's, you know, you watch it in a documentary, you read it in this book and you're like, oh, that's, this is great. I'm, you know, Dennis is, well, I want to go there right now. 
<laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That's the goal. I'm glad it worked off like that. Like, because yeah, it was just a lot to try to track that, that stuff down. Same thing goes for when I really dove into the making of NBA jam mm. and a lot of the details of the book, I mean, stuff like that, you really have to do some legwork and you really have to be persistent. And I've asked a lot of questions. So thankfully, uh, Mark Jamel, the main creator of NBA jam, he's been very gracious with his time. He was such and, an interesting guy yeah. too. Like he, he sounds like, have you read the, an, another book? Have you read ready player one or seen that, that video? Cause he, he seems like he, yeah. he could have been like the either the sci-fi kind of character in the background or that maybe even the the kid who becomes it just because he's a fan and uh you know this kind of guru almost absolutely mark jamel's a little bit of both of those things yeah and the fact that he was such a fan of arcade games and such a fan of basketball that's one of the special ingredients that made nba jam so good you know what i mean Definitely. like it still holds up because he had that passion yeah yeah he see so so i i was talking to josh and i i said uh I want to get you to, to, uh, team up with me. We're going to get Mark to make uh, an NBA bubble life, uh, video game. We want to be, cause I want to play as Lou Williams, uh, escaping, uh, the bubble to go get my lemon pepper wings and go yes, fishing. Magic City. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. And then, and then they could, like ballers. Yeah. And then they could weave in a, a new version of NBA jam right, right in there. And it could, it'd be great in front of those big video screens. They could do all kinds of cool stuff with the setup they've got. Exactly. Virtually. It'd be awesome. So we're exactly. That's our, yeah. That's our, uh, that's my hope after this, we, we get to Mark and he, that's his, that's his last uh, project. He's probably getting closer to retirement now. Or if he's not, he's still hustling. He's really? still hustling. Oh, he's it. over at See? Zynga now. Yeah. And he's still pumping out games. He's really, he's one of those people that found what he loved and really leaned into it. I mean, since the eighties, this guy's throwing himself into his games for years. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, Tremel such a fascinating character. And one of those people that I didn't really know much about until I worked on the book. Yeah. Did you, so did you get a hold? How did you end up getting a hold of him? Did you look him up in the phone book? Like the guy, like the guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I found him on Facebook actually. This okay, is the modern see? equivalent. Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I found him on Facebook. What's funny is I found him years before I actually worked on the book when I had an idea for a different NBA jam story, like a short thing. And I reached out to him and he's like, yeah, you know, we can talk sometime. And it never materialized. And then lo and behold, I basically write his life story <laughs> in that book. So it's funny how things happen. So yeah, I got to know him, um, over the four years of working on the book and I talked to him, I did 10 interviews with him hmm. and some were, were longer than others, but with those 10 interviews, that was re- where I really got to know him and really got to be able to talk about stuff that you won't, might not necessarily need to know about, or, you know, I could even use for the book, but all mm-hmm. that stuff really adds to that detail. So it's really cool. And, um, the really crazy thing is, so Mark's birthday is March 22nd, mm-hmm. which is a really big date in NBA jam lore. Hmm. I mean, MJT March 22, that's right. a secret, secret code character. and he's the best secret character. Yeah. yeah. And, um, on March 22nd, 2008, 18 on that morning and it was his birthday. So I sent him a birthday text and my wife was pregnant at the time and she was due in April. And then she ended up going to the hospital that morning. And then my daughter was born that afternoon. So that night, Mark Trammell was the one sending me a congratulations <laughs> text uh, because she was born on his birthday. And I was <laughs> wow. like, wow, that's incredible. That is so crazy. Um, yeah. I mean, she was like, she was, she was early too. So like yeah. she was born on March 22nd. And also on that day, Trammell was actually giving a, um, Mel was giving a speech on NBA jam or some sort of presentation hmm. over in California that I was thinking about going to. Thankfully I didn't. I mean, yeah. I knew my wife was pregnant, yeah. but I'm really glad I especially didn't go. Cause I would have missed the birth of my, <laughs> yeah. my child. So, yeah. um, but yeah, that's the crazy thing about NBA jam is I've got all these connections to it now that are even much more broader than what I had as a kid. All right. Well, okay. So the, I, I teased it earlier. Which secret character are you picking? If you're going to be one of the secret characters, <laughs> gosh, I mean, from skills standpoint, you got to go with Mark Trammell because he's a nine or 10 in every category. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of the ridiculous characters, I love Bill Clinton just for yes. the visual. I mean, <laughs> take aside like the context of who Bill Clinton is nowadays and all that and just have that like, you know, that 94, 95 version of Bill Clinton where he's like, you know, it's a different kind of Bill Clinton. You know, this is pre Monica Lewinsky. I know. I just love that Bill Clinton, just that <laughs> bizarre image of Bill Clinton dunking. Yeah. It's so cool to me. And that's so NBA jam to me is like, oh, let's put Bill Clinton in a game. Um, so I definitely got to go with Bill Clinton or Al gore or one of those that just over the top i love it so do you think it would work to, you think it would work today i know it's kind of speculative but just like could they do is that part of the reason like they can't do so many of the fun things that that made nba jam nba jam that they can't you know everything's got to be I don't, I, you know the licensing was an interesting part of the story what's the the guy is it uh, roger sharp that does all the, <laughs> did all the licensing um 
I'm sure that seemed tough even then. Do you think it would even be possible to the the what spider web you'd have to create today to get up to get some of that stuff in there? Yeah, you wouldn't be able to do much of that stuff nowadays, especially considering that back in the day that Acclaim, the company who released the home games that had all those secret characters in them, the really famous ones like Bill Clinton and George Clinton and Fresh Prince Bel-Air, th- those guys weren't actually paid to be in NBA Jam. So Acclaim basically <laughs> went around and it was this kind of wild west of video games, just a totally different time where, you know, you could be featured in a video game and not know about it until you found out much later. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so in working on the book, I found out that DJ Jazzy Jeff and George Clinton, neither of them got paid. Wow. Uh, to be an NBA jam, which is just crazy. I it mean, is. like these guys are, um, but I mean, it makes You'd sense. You'd still be excited though, right? Cause the nineties I feel like was different in that people hadn't connected that, Hey, I should be getting paid for, for that, you know? So it was almost like you, the payment was like, wow, cool. I'm in cause video games too were, were nice, you know, in their nascent stages. So it was more of a novelty thing. You did, you didn't again, like connect like NBA jam is five times bigger than Jurassic park. It just wasn't, you know, wasn't thought of in that same way 100 percent, and i mean that's one of the things is that i think that you know if you were there like let's say you were one of these guys who's in a secret a secret character in a game of the 90s and you liked video games that would be such a cool cool thing i mean dg jazzy jeff somebody <laughs> who didn't get paid a dime to be an nba jam would still do it today oh. because it was so cool to be part of the game for sure um and then yeah i mean think about games nowadays like you can find all kinds of mods and skins and hacks yeah. online and create <laughs> yeah. a player modes and yeah you know there's a gazillion things but in the 90s like the idea of being yourself in the game that was not a thing <laughs> yeah. you know so for those celebrities who embraced it and who liked it that was something really special so how many interviews total did you do did you end up doing for for the book I did 68 interviews. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And one of those, so one of those is Shaq. So I got, I got to hear a, a Shaq story if you, if you got it. Cause I, I still, I still love him. He's always, you know, just such a, such a character. He's like an NBA jam character come to life. We just watched a uh, LSU versus uh, Loyola Marymount and watched him as a freshman in college. And gosh, even that in that game, I don't, I, I thought I would have thought he wouldn't have been good in that, but he's amazing in that. Like it's like 150 to like 138 eight or something and he's running up and down and Duncan he's a he's a such an amazing player I love Shaq but to me that that young Shaq is so special like yeah. he was super super athletic it's and just crazy. everywhere he was so big um and just yeah just really imposing as well man I mean don't get me wrong I love Lakers era Shaq too for different reasons but that young <laughs> Shaq that's something special to me yeah. um yeah so Shaq was easily my biggest get for the book I mean I got to talk to all the guys who made the game and George Clinton and DJ Jazzy Jeff but in terms of people that my mom would recognize Shaq is way up there like I can bring <laughs> Shaq to my mom and be like I got Shaq for this book. this is a real thing um but yeah so i i tried to track him down through his agent and then eventually got hold of his agent and then i spent about four or five months just trying to nail him down for this interview so you know there's a few missed calls you know a few times and we almost it almost happened Mm -hmm. but he ended up canceling or whatever um or didn't happen and then one day i remember i was at work and she was like okay yeah he can do it today (laughs) wow really so i had an i had an appointment scheduled with this insurance agent for my day job and i had to like i had to (laughs) sent an email to this guy. It's like, sorry, Jeff, I I can't make the call today. Something came up. And I didn't tell this insurance agent in North Carolina that it was actually Shaq. <laughs> He's definitely like, not believing you. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was just so absurd that this customer service guy is going to be like saying, sorry, Jeff, can't do this call because Shaq's going to call me. Yeah, it's, like the state, like, it's like the reverse of the State Farm commercial. <laughs> like, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I got to go. Yeah, yeah. I got to go. Shaq's on the other line. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm glad I delayed that appointment because that was the day. Um, so yeah, so I went and I remember like slipping away into this little silent room, this little huddle room at my work. And I waited there right at the time and I waited there and it felt like an eternity. And I mean, I don't really fanboy out too much Mm -hmm. because I've talked to so many people and I don't say that to brag, but more like I've realized that like they'll take you more seriously. If you just talk to somebody like a person, if you don't go like, Oh my God, I loved you and whatever. Right. Um, but even then I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to talk to Shaq. Like (laughs) I love Shaq as a kid. Are you kidding me? I love also he's 12 feet tall. I think just something about the size of the man has got to be just like, okay, yeah, that's Shaq. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. The size of, of him and yeah. I mean just I mean just thinking that even relating to NBA Jam itself oh, the series is like he was on the cover of NBA Showtime oh, and NBA Hoops. I mean like he's been there forever. Um but yeah so I waited around for like five minutes and he didn't call and I was like okay maybe not. So I sent him his agent a message and then or rather I sent her a text
text. And then she sent me a text back and she's like, he hasn't called yet. Give it a second. Hmm. And then boom, unknown caller. And I pick <laughs> it up and he goes, hello. And it's like, oh my God, it's Shaq. It's really Shaq. And I'm like trying to be like, I'm not, you know, not going to freak out. Got to get to this interview. Got to get the material for this book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was backing out of his driveway in uh, Florida and I was in my huddle room in my office in Ohio. Yeah. And I remember him distinctly, you know, he, you know how if you are in your car and you don't have your door closed, your seatbelt in, it makes like a ding, ding, ding sound. <laughs> yeah. Like it made like that ding, ding, ding sound. He's talking to me on his car phone. And I was like, did you find you know, out which car is he, is he driving? Is he driving that big old semi that he had? Or <laughs> Oh my gosh. He's no, got the craziest cars too. Oh, <laughs> I should have asked. I should have asked, but I definitely, yeah, I could tell he was driving. Yeah. So as he was pulling out, like, you know, it's making that ding, ding, ding sound. Right. And I was like, hey, man, are you sure you're like your door's closed, your seatbelt's buckled in? And I was like, this is so weird. Like, I'm in Ohio talking to Shaq, pulling out of his driveway in Florida, about to talk about NBA Jam. Hey, you could have saved, like, saved his life, though. I saw there was a reporter the other day. Somebody noticed she had a lump on her neck and she went into the doctor and uh, she had like a had to have a tumor removed. So you might have saved Shaq. Who knows? Right? Absolutely. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was like it was so cool. And what was really amazing about it was the fact that he was such a big NBA jam fan. Nah. I mean, he didn't, you know, of course he was doing this because, uh, his agent was super cool. And she was like, yeah, give this guy, you know, throw this guy a bone right. this interview for this book. But he was really great to talk to. And he really genuinely loved NBA jam. I mean, he would tell me these amazing stories about having an NBA jam machine at his place. And then the guys from the magic <laughs> lived near him coming over and playing on, oh my God. on the cabinet and just these amazing visuals that like, you know, you realize like the guy who's in the game is playing the oh, game. For I mean, sure. I mean, for the, like and especially for the time period taking that back in time to the 90s that was something really special i mean you see nba players playing games all the time now it's not a big deal yeah, they're so on twitch like, oh. or whatever yeah exactly they're on twitch i mean there's something happening all the time yeah. but the idea that Shaq and the magic like the classic magic squad oh, of man and penny and nick anderson and scott skiles dennis scott like all those guys are hanging around in a hotel room together yeah playing nba jam or visiting Shaq's house playing nba jam that's amazing stuff yeah um so yeah so i got to talk to him about NBA Jam for a bit, little uh, learn a little bit about his technique. His <laughs> whole approach to NBA Jam is he never goes with he never he's never once played it as himself. What? He always goes with a three point shooter. Uh, okay. Got to go with Chris Mullen. Got to go with Reggie Miller. Got to okay. go with somebody who can do something that he can't do. So what's funny that is that sense. you know for us as kids, NBA Jam was wish fulfillment. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, I want to dunk. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it's funny thinking for Shaq, it's wish fulfillment too. He's an amazing three point shooter in this game. Yeah. So. He's on fire. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And he even did, he even gave me a boom shakalaka on the call, oh, which was so yes. cool. So, um, yeah, no, Shaq was very decent. It's one of those things where like, you never know what's going to happen when you talk to somebody that you really admire, you know, a lot about, No doubt. but in, in Shaq's case, like he really was, was as awesome as I expected. And it was great. It was one of the centerpieces of the book in terms of a big interview. We, we hit a couple of the, catchphrases but uh tim plays a big role in, in in this as well and that was that was so interesting so does he really talk like that in, in real life and what, what was he like as uh, as an interview yeah tim kitzrow has got he's got a pretty he's got a, a nice voice in real life like you know just just talking to him but yeah. man when he goes into the mode he really just becomes the <laughs> nba jam guy all over again <laughs> like he'll do the like he would leave me voicemails that would go Boom shakalaka, Shaq to the rim. <laughs> hey, Rayon, it's Tim over here. How you doing? And it's like, oh my God, you're leaving me voicemails as the NBA Jam guy. I mean, you are the NBA Jam guy, but it's still like that moment of geeking out. Um, okay. Tim was a very decent dude and somebody with some really interesting perspective because so much of our memories associated with NBA Jam are just so positive and so happy. I mean, you think about the game, you know, being played everywhere, all these players loving it and making a ton of money, yeah. all these different versions and all the great times you had with it. And then you realize that Tim, somebody who is so crucial to this game. I mean, he's the guy who's, he's on fire, boom shakalaka, mm -hmm. the nail in the coffin, all that stuff. He was only paid 1500 bucks for that original <laughs> game. No royalties afterward. Wild. And then paid only $3,000 for the home games. 
So it was pretty bittersweet learning about him, but yeah. he was really open and revealing. And that really added a human element to it too. Cause you know, I want to write a book about NBA jam as a fan, but I also don't want it to be a fan book. You no, know what I mean? Like yeah. I want it to be, Oh, let's really tell the story about what happened over here and how people's lives were impacted. Um, Tim was really one of the revelations of the book and one in some ways, if there's any kind of like tragic character at NBA jam or like a tragic, happy story, yeah. it's Tim kiss Rose. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, there was something magic about, about his voice and just the, excitement that it brought. And that was, that fits in that nineties, you know, time period too, because all the sports center guys had all their little catchphrases and it just, uh, that, that phraseology that he came up with just <laughs> added such a fun, uh, fun element to it. Hey, you can go to his, uh, website too. I, I uh, have my own voicemail. I had to pay for it, but it's all right. It's, it was worth it. Uh, so I've got him as, That's as, awesome. as my voicemail for my first summer until I go back to school at least. So, uh, <laughs> That's pretty, amazing. pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's, let's, Let's talk about, I wanted to see, just get into like the, the downfall of it, like for temporarily, it goes, it goes away and like midway. Is it just the, the home console you think, or, or, or is it just sort of I uh, I don't know. It was just reading about it. It seemed like so many times in, in American life, you hear, you hit these highs and that's the most difficult thing is staying up at that peak because everybody, I don't know, the, Pat Riley calls it like the disease of more or, or whatever it was, I don't know if you felt like you had a, a grad grasp on what happened or, uh, or just, you know, a thought about what, what happened to, to NBA jam. Yeah. I mean, in the case of NBA jam, so what happened in, I think it was 995 is midway and acclaim parted ways. So midway made the original home version. I'm sorry, the original arcade version, acclaim made the home versions. And the idea was that midway would make the games and then acclaim would license them for Got the it. super Nintendo or Sega Genesis or whatever. Um, are on all these other systems, but then Midway said, wait a second, we could make so much more money off of selling our, our own home games versus just licensing them out. Yeah. So they split up in 95 and Acclaim had access to that NBA Jam license and basically torpedoed it. I mean, the reality is that like all the Acclaim games, like maybe there's like one good one out of that bunch. They made NBA Jam Extreme with Marv Albert in 996, which was really bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, you know, this is another funny thing about NBA Jam is that Tim Kisro started off doing basically a Marv Albert impression and then three years later Marv Albert's in NBA Jam <laughs> trying, so, to do, trying to do an impression of, uh, of him almost yeah. exactly exactly <laughs> yeah so so strange how that works um, but in NBA Jam's case Acclaim knew that NBA Jam was big you know after it, you know it made the billion dollars in the arcade for Midway and mm -hmm. after it sold tons of copies on the home consoles Acclaim knew that they couldn't let this go so Acclaim were one of those companies that were very shrewd about the business side of things I mean mm -hmm. they knew that this was a license and and they said, you know, we're here to make NBA Jam games. We're not here to make games in Mark Turmel's vision. Yeah. So Mark Turmel would have nothing to do with those games. And Acclaim basically drove it into the ground by releasing all these subpar games and just pumping them out. I mean, they had, I think it was NBA Jam 99 or 2000 that had Keith Van Horn on the cover. <laughs> and Sorry. I mean, I forget yeah. about that game until I see it. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. 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 Does, I mean, and then it was good player, but uh, doesn't seem to be in the, in the in line with Shaq or or the, the or some of the others exactly and that's not that's not hating on the no. guy who was like the net once upon a time right exactly but more hating on the fact that yeah that acclaim just had all these games that they were just basically pumping out they were trying to do it like ea would yeah. year after year but you can't do that with nba jam nba jam is not that game like right. there's only so much you can do with nba jam before it loses luster or you're like okay this is too not nba jam for me yeah yeah so but they did come back with a, the reboot you, you hit on the 2010 uh reboot which actually seemed kind of awesome like the way the way to do it oh yeah personally i love the 2010 reboot because there's a lot of passion poured into it and even even aside from all the work that i did learning about it for the book just as a fan playing the game i can tell that the people that made this they love nba jam yeah um so yeah so what happened was acclaim had the nba jam license from like 95 to 2003 or so when they went under and then it sat dormant for a spell until about 2009 or so or 2008 i think when uh the guys at ea were working on this basketball game that was going to be a two-on-two -two game inspired by nba jam when they said why don't we just try to get the nba jam license itself <laughs> and then lo and behold they got that and then it turned into a whole game and it did really well for ea yeah except ea is just not into arcade games really i mean hmm. and they just 
pushed it aside, which was surprising to the guys that worked on the on the new version of NBA Jam 2, just because it did so well for such a small budget. But the passion for NBA Jam is still there, and I think it could absolutely make a comeback. The big thing is presenting it in the right format and having the right people behind it. Right. So you think so you think we're 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 on to something getting a hold of Termel and uh, NBA, NBA Bubble Life. It's com- it's coming. <laughs> oh, definitely. You know what? Honestly, even to take out NBA Jam from the picture, I would 100 percent play an NBA Bubble video <laughs> for game. Sure, right? I just yeah. want to go fishing, honestly, as as JaVale, I saw JaVale McGee on his uh, little YouTube video going, there we go. going fishing. There we go. I'm like, oh, this yeah. is great. I'm fishing as JaVale McGee. <laughs> yeah. And if you play as Rajon Rondo, you yeah. can upgrade your hotel room yes. at certain points. Oh you know what I mean? God. You max out your stance. The food, yeah. the food, just trying to get food in would alone, I could probably, is a Sims version of uh, the game. Would, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The whole Lou Will video game. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you can have like a stage like GTA with Magic City in there. There's <laughs> yes. a lot you could do. Yes. Oh man. Well, hey, I appreciate so much you uh, coming on uh, this evening and taking time to talk about this. And uh, I'm going to put the links in the, the show notes and send it out to everyone I, I can think of to uh, read your book. Um, it, it, it has a lot of the stuff we talked about, but so much more. Like, again, to, to get that real painting of the picture uh, of, the, of Chicago and gets into kind of where the coin-op games even came into the picture in Chicago, which I loved because I'm a history guy. So I love that kind of game gangster past and the pinball machines and just all that, all that stuff is so, so interesting and really tells a, a story from beginning to, to end. And uh, I, I'm hopeful that uh, we're going to get a new version someday. So it, maybe you'll have a, be able to do an addendum someday on how it came back again. Well, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely. NBA Jam is definitely going to come back someday. I don't know when, but it's going to come back. I mean, with a franchise like NBA Jam where it's so recognizable, there's no way that it's going to stay dormant forever. Somebody's going to be like, wait a second. They haven't been released an NBA Jam game since 2010. So it's going to happen someday. I mean, I'm crossing my fingers, too, as a big NBA Jam fan. It'll come back. I don't know when, but it's going to come back. They better get you there to document it. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> my dream, my real uh, pie in the sky dream is them putting me in as a secret character in one. Oh version. my like, gosh. oh man, if I do that, then I know what I've really made it and all those four years would have been really worth it. Yes. I love it, man. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the 199 podcast with HVS, the high volume shooters. For more information, check out the blog at 199.com under HVS. And while you're there, do yourself a favor and pick up some retro college shorts. Till next time.